And joining Bernard is Sidant Gupta, Head of Future Grid for Asia Pacific Siemens Singapore. Also, Nirupa Chanda, Country Managing Director, Hitachi, ABB Power Grid Singapore. And we also have Go Chi Kyung, CEO Green Mobility Sunseep Group Singapore. And rounding off the panel is Kelvin Lim, CEO DuraPower Group Singapore. Caroline and the panel, over to you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the session on preparing for mass electrification and the big street strategy. Uh, my sincere apologies for not being able to join the event in person today. Uh, so as briefly mentioned, uh, in this session, we'll be discussing what are some of the technologies and sectors that will help drive a low carbon future in Singapore. What are some of the challenges and ways uh, around it? And I'm joined today uh, by five esteemed panelists. Before we kick off the discussion, I'd like to give the panelists the time to briefly introduce themselves uh, and their company. So uh, maybe Bernard, we can start with you and go down the road. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm Bernard Esselings. I'm the CEO of Senoco Energy, uh, which is one of the largest uh, power generation companies in Singapore. I've been in the, the power sector for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, my mother company is uh, NG. Hi, everyone. My name is Sid. Um, I'm an electrical engineer from NTU Singapore. I've uh, been in the energy sector for almost a decade now. Uh, in the last couple of years, been with Siemens and uh, now heading the future grid business for Siemens in Asia Pac. Uh, hello, everyone. Very glad to be here today. I'm Nirupa. I head the Hitachi ABB Power Grids business here in Singapore over the last few years. Uh, Hitachi ABB grid Power Grids is a newly formed company by the combination of uh, Hitachi's strong heritage in the area of social innovation and the power grids business from ABB, which has been working towards you know, stronger, smarter, greener grids. Uh, so very excited to share our views here today. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Chi Kyung. I'm the CEO of uh, Charge Plus, uh, the green mobility arm of uh, you know, uh, Sunship Group. And I'm looking at Frank, uh, the CEO of uh, Sunship, uh, just in front of me. Right, so we all know Sunship as the largest renewable energy uh, you know, operator and company in Singapore. Uh, and Charge Plus essentially is the diversification of uh, Sunship to green mobility. And uh, we have articulated the ambition for 10,000 charging points uh, in Singapore by 2030. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin. I'm the group CEO of uh, Dura Power. Okay. Um, very happy to be here this morning to be part of the panelists. Uh, just to share a little bit more about the company, uh, Dura Power is a homegrown um, energy storage system company. We research, we develop, we manufacture, and we system integrate and supply uh, energy storage solutions uh, in the global market, currently more than 20 countries. Um, applications that we supply to includes heavily on e-mobility as well as stationary applications. And uh, I'll be very happy to share some of the uh, thoughts uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now to jump into the discussion. So Singapore has put forth a long-term low emissions development strategy uh, aiming to halve its peak emissions by 2050 and to achieve net zero emissions as early as possible in the second half of the century. Uh, Nirupa, if I could kick off the discussion with you, uh, through your experience you know, working with grids and, and the various uh, stakeholders, what are some of the technologies uh, that Singapore may adopt to help enable the switch to a low carbon future? Yeah, thanks for that question, Caroline. I think it was uh, very beautifully articulated by the minister yesterday at the keynote of, of SU um, that you know, Singapore is adopting four key switches as part of its, uh, you know, continuing to evolve its energy story. Uh, we're quite proud to say that you know, we've been part of this energy story over the last five decades in Singapore today. Uh, we, our equipment helps run the world's most reliable electricity network. We've been working with the likes of EMA and Singapore Power for, uh, for these last uh, decades and supporting them with new technology. 
Uh, but looking forward, I mean, Singapore has an interesting challenge. Uh, obviously, we're not blessed with a lot of you know, natural uh, wind resource and not a lot of space for solar. Uh, but despite this, uh, you can see that the vision is, uh, is clear, that they will be working towards uh, solar. And, uh, you know, they're advancing their efforts to implement you know, 1.5 gigawatt peak of solar installed base by 2025. And what kind of technologies will actually enable this is uh, a combination of things, for example, energy storage to help stabilize the intermittency and yet help maintain the reliability that the network and this country requires. So we've had several examples in other countries where we've been deploying such technology working uh, at the distribution and at the consumer level. Uh, the other area is around uh, decarbonization, so uh, you know, using technologies such as low carbon alternatives, hydrogen, et cetera, that uh, the minister also mentioned, uh, will be imperative to help Singapore uh, you know, reduce its carbon emissions and meet its target. Uh, and I think finally, this, uh, I was very glad to hear about uh, the, the clear ambition for the regional power grid uh, in Singapore, because it's a combination of solutions that will finally you know, help us reach uh, the, the targets in the Paris Agreement that Singapore has signed up for. Uh, as a technology provider, I mean, we're clear the technology exists. Uh, but the key challenges remain around, uh, you know, policy, regulatory frameworks, market, um, and obviously technical harmonization across the grids. Uh, but Singapore's plans to first start with, you know, 100 megawatts between Malaysia and Singapore is technically feasible today, but to test it out over the next few years to then, you know, move forward to larger interconnectors across, uh, across ASEAN. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, some of the examples which were clearly laid out uh, and we are very much in, in support of. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Nirupa. And you brought up a few points, uh, such as the regional power grid and the adoption of solar in Singapore. And I definitely want to revisit that. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the decarbonization that's ongoing. And one very big piece of the discussion, whenever we talk about decarbonization, is on mass electrification, right? So converting as much of the final energy demand into electricity, which is then powered by clean energy sources. And it's not just cleaner sources, and electric-based economies also more efficient. So overall, less energy is needed. And when we think about electrification, very often one of the biggest sectors um, that's very much talked about globally is, is the mobility sector. Uh, so Sid, if I may turn uh, the time now to you, uh, could you just share with us how is Simmons uh, supporting this transition uh, in Singapore and, and largely around Asia? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Carolyn. Um, so I think the electrification of mobility is a very critical step towards sustainability. Um, as most of us would know, almost a quarter of our global emission comes from the mobility sector, and 70% of that is through the road transport. So it, it is critical to make sure that we are moving toward more sustainable sources and electrification of mobility is one such step. Now, if today we talk to most people, uh, the two biggest barriers that one discusses towards this electrification is the need for power, so power grids, and the second would be charging infrastructure. And th these barriers become critical when we look at mass uh, mass enablement of electrification, whether it's on the e-car side or the bus or heavy vehicle side of transport. Uh, just to share with you an example, uh, recently we, we did a project in New Zealand where we powered up um, two depots and about 35 electric buses, total capacity of around four megawatt. Um, most of the grids are able to support that, but when we move to complete depots, getting electrified, talking about 300, 400 buses, um, that is a huge power requirement which would really force us to rethink the way we design and uh, really plan our cities as well as the depots. Um, closer to home in, in Singapore, uh, currently the LTA is piloting 60 electric buses and uh, we've already seen that there is a mix of um, plug-in charging in depot as well as the need for uh, opportunity or pentograph charging to really top up uh, charging during the day for, for the heavy vehicles. Um, so I think that that becomes extremely critical, and, and luckily, from a, from a Siemens standpoint, we, we come from the grid side of, uh, of business, and for us to really uh, couple our hardware and software um, to really uh, make this seamless transition without impacting much of the operations for our operators or authorities is the aim or is the goal. 
Um, the way we do that is really trying to focus on, on technology that is, first of all, future-proof. That's essential because the evolution that is taking place in this space is really fast. Uh, what you may have as an infrastructure today may become redundant in five years, and that would not really uh, support uh, a lot of the operators to really move towards, uh, uh, towards this technology. The second part is to really optimize. Yeah? So for, with the software and the digital layer, uh, through different load management, load shifting uh, possibilities, we try to make sure that the, the, whatever capacity that exists today can be optimized to deploy as many charging infrastructure that is possible. But also, uh, the, the space is evolving to, to, let's say, have really fast charging possible on the heavy vehicle side of things. So uh, the battery voltage is going up, the chemistry changing. And uh, the aim for the company is to really make sure that we are, we are supplying future-proof technologies uh, into this uh, sector. So overall, I would say, um, uh, I mean, Siemens, uh, this is critical for us, uh, this uh, electrification of mobility. And uh, I think it's very exciting times because uh, both in Singapore and overall in Asia, most governments have realized that this is a step which needs to be incentivized, which needs to be supported, uh, and we are playing our part in really providing the, the technology behind it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And, and it, go ahead, Sorry. And, and same thing for the. Uh, Thanks for that, Sid. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, Singapore has now focused, uh, announced a few targets with regards to electric mobility. You know, they plan to phase out internal combustion engines by 2040. And of course, there's uh, 28,000 charging points targets uh, by 2030 and government-related locations alone. Uh, and you rightly mentioned that, you know, one of the challenges really often that we hear is, is uh, regard, uh, related to charging infrastructure. So, uh, Chi Kang, I'd like to turn the time now to you. Um, you know, a, a lot of times when people talk about charging infrastructures for uh, electric mobility, it's often a chicken and egg thing. So, I'd like to hear your views on that. Uh, and also, what are some of the biggest challenges in developing the necessary infrastructure, such as uh, fast charging, to reach a fully electric fleet? How can we address them? Well, uh, let me start by uh, saying that uh, the true value of uh, electric vehicles is uh, very much understated in many parts of uh, Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, electric vehicles holistically, there is tremendous potential for EVs to make a profound impact on uh, emissions reduction. Right? So really, my first recommendation is really for policymakers in Asia uh, to communicate that uh, you know, holistic set of uh, benefits of uh, EVs uh, to the wider population in a very consistent uh, manner. Now, if I take Singapore as an example, right, uh, you know, the transport sector in Singapore contributes about 14%, it's not trivial, 14% to the emissions profile of Singapore as a country. And you go to many other countries in Asia, uh, the profile of, uh, you know, transport sector uh, as part of the total emissions profile of the country is even higher than 40% typically, right? Now, in Singapore, if you convert the internal combustion engine uh, vehicle to electric vehicle, we are going to see close to 50% emissions reduction on a holistic basis, right? On a net basis, after you factor in the emissions from our power plants because of, of our friends like uh, Sinuco, right? They, they use uh, natural gas uh, for uh, fossil fuel power uh, generation in Singapore. And that's the cleanest uh, form of uh, fossil fuel power generation that you can have uh, on Earth, right? So overall, the, the emissions... Uh, profile of power generation in Singapore is uh, relatively uh, good compared to many other uh, you know, countries in Asia. Right? So if I look at Singapore as an example, after you factor in the emissions uh, from charging and electric vehicle, we're still going to get a hefty 50% emissions reduction. And that communication, I think, needs to be provided by policymakers in a consistent manner to the wider population because there are a lot of misperceptions out there. Is uh, electric vehicle truly green? Because, you know, you're going to still take electricity from the power plants. So my first recommendation is really for policymakers throughout Asia, be consistent in messaging because the holistic benefits of uh, EVs uh, have not been really articulated clearly throughout this whole region. Let me move on to another key uh, problem that we should address, that is really the lack of localized power supply. Now, we all know that uh, to promote EV adoption in many parts of uh, Asia and the world, you need to have a pervasive EV charging infrastructure. That goes without saying, right? Because you're not going to see chargers 
uh, in the neighborhood, you know, you see charges at your doorstep. Uh, the, the mental model is that, oh, there's range anxiety, would, would, would my uh, you know, uh, EV store in the middle of the road, right? So to have that pervasive charging network is crucial to uh, EV adoption in any part of the world. But in Singapore and in many parts of Asia, the bottleneck is really the lack of localized power supply. What do I mean by that? <coughs> I'm not actually referring to the power grid because uh, in many places, the power grid is actually sufficient. But when the building developers and owners designed the buildings decades ago, they did not anticipate that there will be tremendous need for EV charging today and in the future. Right? So, so they did not prepare for it. <laughs> and very often when we go to buildings in Singapore, and I, 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 I say that it's probably the, 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 the same case in the region as well, there's not enough power supply to the car parks and in the street room, right? So there's a huge limitation <coughs> to the ability of the country, therefore, to implement EV charging points. So my recommendation is really for policymakers, for the key uh, government agencies to really encourage uh, the landlords, the building owners across the country to actively upgrade the switch room and power capacity leading to the car parks. And even maybe consider mandating new buildings uh, in the country to have power supply, to be EV ready. Because unless we address that, we can talk about installing EV charging uh, points across the country pervasively, that will be a consistent bottleneck uh, that we'll see. Now, speaking from the uh, you know, role as uh, you know, someone running Charge Plus as part of a Sunship group, uh, we also bring smart charging solutions uh, to the table, right? What do I mean by smart charging solutions? If the building only has one X of power supply to the car park, by having a, a smart charging solution, I can convince the landlord to install EV chargers that have a combined capacity that is 2x or 3x, right? And if, if so happens that all the cars are charging at the same time, that needs to consume 2x or 3x, my smart charging solution will dynamically, in real-time fashion, reduce the power supply uh, being given to each car, such that I still cap the amount of power supply to the vehicles at X, right? By doing so, I can install much more charging points uh, across many uh, premises in Singapore. So that's something that Charge Plus will want to avail to Singapore and the region. And we think it's a game changer to getting more EV chargers installed in many car park premises uh, throughout Singapore. And the other part about uh, you know, uh, uh, having more chargers in Singapore is really about uh, having tight car parks, right? When you have tight car parks in a in a dense country like Singapore, and we're all very familiar with the lack of uh, space in Singapore, right? Um, it makes it very hard to install a charger in our premises without intruding into the airspace of the parking lots. And this is where, you know, we hope that the Charge Plus can make a difference. Uh, we have introduced what's known as an ultra-slim, uh, you know, charger to the market, by which, uh, you know, it's less than 15 centimeters wide, it can be mounted in a lot of uh, columns, uh, on columns, which typically will be 30 centimeters wide, and which uh, most AC chargers will not be able to be mounted on, right? So, so therefore, by having ultra slim chargers, the, the chargers can be pervasively installed in many parts of the car park, thereby enabling even wider adoption. So that's, that's something that we want to uh, do to make a difference uh, for the Singapore market and beyond. So if, if I may add on to Ji Kyung's point um, about what the biggest challenges are in trying to reach a full electric mobility fleet, um, I will broadly categorize the challenges in two parts. Right? First, we talk about commercially. EVs are going to cost higher in KPEX, while savings would be derived from the OPEX. So it is important for fleet owners to consider it from the perspective of a TCO, total cost of ownership. Um, and to further optimize the operational investment and deployment through better fleet management and operation planning. Now, the second part, I'll address it on technically. So, managing the user experience is important. So, taking Singapore um, as a context, commercial electric vehicles, fleets especially, are used quite differently from consumer EVs. For electric mobility fleets, minimum vehicle downtime for charging, uh, including, as Chico mentioned, the limited parking space that, that, that is in, in Singapore. 
and the maximum operational distance should not be compromised. This would mean that EVs must be provided the options to have fast charging or opportunity charging, which could be addressed by battery or charging technologies um, available today. Just to further cite an example, um, so DuraPower has, has implemented um, battery solutions. We have electrified bus fleets in Europe. And um, while it is good that fleets are being um, electrified in a very organized manner, in this case, organized charging, organized um, operational profile, they bring challenges to, for instance, in a certain location, the grid may not be um, ready to support fast charging. And, and in, that, in that instance, uh, we have deployed battery solutions to operate like an electrical buffer to protect the grid, doing peak shaving and, and other uh, functions like that. Thank you. Maybe just to add to that, and I, I, I could not agree more with the panelists here. Um, for example, in Singapore, uh, the government had the idea to have about 28,000 charging points. We would need much more than that. Uh, we would definitely need, um, if we are looking at a significant part of our um, consumer EVs to move to uh, electric, um, then we have to provide charging points which are much more in number, maybe five folds of those numbers. And um, as was mentioned earlier as well, um, I think really to be able to optimize what is available at that localized grid level would be critical to, to deploy that. Um, again, here, I think different uh, vehicles would have different needs. So when we're looking at, let's say, cars versus a fleet of uh, van for last mile deliveries, where we would see some of the warehouses um, or factories moving into a mini depot to provide that charging infrastructure. Utilization of those chargers become another very critical point uh, because a lot of times what we see is that a lot of the infrastructure is being used for let's say four or five hours period o overnight and then during the night that's sufficient to, uh, with the battery capacity and the, and the kind of kilometers that, that, or the mileage that those vehicles will be driving. So how really you utilize those charging infrastructure as well as have more and more charging infrastructure. Uh, often uh, if you look at the, the vehicles today, uh, the battery sizes, with one charge, a car could probably go for three days to four days uh, on a normal mileage of Singapore without needing another charge. So really at times the fast charging is not the need, but in other cases when we look at the heavy vehicle or the last mile delivery vans, then there would be a need for heavy or fast charging. Uh, what really this brings to us is that there has to be a lot of planning going on in really defining what is needed by different verticals of these um, vehicles uh, and how we can provide those uh, in terms of making sure that every aspect, whether it's consumer EVs or our heavy buses, trucks, are moving to electric, uh, can be deployed. And uh, of course, the total cost of ownership becomes an extremely critical point here because at the end of the day for the operators, uh, it has to make commercial sense. Um, I think there have been some, some push, some incentives uh, starting next year uh, in Singapore to, to incentivize people to move to EVs, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's room to do much more to make sure that there is, first of all, more charging infrastructure, and secondly, the total cost of ownership can be brought down. Thank you, and uh, great to hear that, you know, despite all the challenges, there are still innovations uh, coming up, and Hopefully, moving forward, there will be a more supportive framework uh, to drive the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, now, if mass electrification is the key strategy to reducing carbon emissions, then you know one of the points that Chi Kyung mentioned earlier and the perception of end consumers is how clean is the electricity that's coming on the grid? Uh, Bernard, if I may turn to you, uh, as one of the largest power generation companies here in Singapore, could you just please share what are some of the initiatives uh, power companies have embarked uh, on to this and to produce electricity in the cleanest way possible? Thank you, Caroline. I mean, first, it's good news to hear that uh, electricity demand is going to go up, being an electricity producer. Uh, maybe I'd like to address uh, two points about it. The first is about the availability of electricity. And to this, just to put things in context, um, I think people need not to worry uh, because in Singapore there has been uh, overcapacity for at least six years. Obviously in the short term, COVID also had had a um, uh, negative impact on demand, which is about 3% down on, on last year. Plus if we look at, um, we, we've looked at numbers of what does it mean in 2040 where all vehicles are electrified. 
And we reckon there would be about 1 million uh, vehicles that would consume uh, about 7 uh, terawatt hours uh, per year. And that represents approximately 14% of today's demand of electricity. So it's a growth of, I would say, less than 1% uh, on annual basis, linear growth, uh, which is nice, but you know, it's entirely manageable, I would say. Plus, there's a lot of focus on efficiency these days, uh, and rightly so, and, and that may also offset some of that additional demand. So I would say from a quantity point of view, um, we, we, we should be able to handle this. Now, from an emission point of view, uh, I was glad that CK uh, already highlighted the fact that by just switching uh, to electric vehicle, you are comparing the efficiency of a combustion engine with the efficiency of a combined cycle gas turbine, and indeed, you're improving by about a factor two. Now, how can we further um, improve? Um, I would say in the short term, uh, we, we can continue to invest in improving the efficiency of our plants, um, and that's what we've been doing at, at Senoco. Uh, recently, we completed an upgrade on, on two of our machines that will um, generate uh, carbon CO2 savings uh, of about 10,000 to 15,000 ton uh, per year. So that's something that uh, we will continue doing, uh, but that's only incremental. Then the, the second thing, which is more medium term, is that when um, more capacity is, um, is required, we can invest in uh, machines with a higher efficiency. So today, the H-type units has probably an efficiency which is about 10% uh, better than, than the current fleet um, in Singapore. However, there are some um, concerns and obstacles with that as well. For example, the bigger size of those units in a small system like uh, Singapore means that in case of breakdown, the, the grid stability may be at risk, so you need to maintain uh, higher uh, reserves to deal with that, which also has a, has a cost. And ultimately, in a system like Singapore, you, you probably need a mix of um, assets. You cannot have only um, large uh, H-type units because some of those units are not going to be running that often. And if you run them at part load, they're not going to be uh, very efficient. So you need to have um, uh, also a, a mix of assets that are probably cheaper, will not run very often, uh, but will be there when we need them. And then I would say in the uh, longer term, uh, we are exploring um, things which are aligned with uh, the, the vision of Singapore, which is um, green hydrogen, which is blue hydrogen, which is produced from uh, hydrocarbons, um, and, and you can add a carbon capture um, and, and use it to it, or oxy combustion. Now, there are still uh, quite a few obstacles for this because uh, today those technologies are not ready. Uh, even if you talk about hydrogen, the current gas turbines can uh, probably run on maximum 30% uh, of hydrogen uh, co-mixed with uh, natural gas. And gas turbines which can uh, run on 100% hydrogen will not be on the market until at the earliest 2025. Some, probably sometime between 2025 and, and 2030. The second aspect is that you will need to put a whole new supply chain in place for, for hydrogen, a bit similar to what has been done for um, LNG. And if you're talking about um, uh, carbon capture, uh, you will also need to find uh, uses uh, for, for, for that carbon. And, and the third element is that the cost is still very high. We, we hope that it will decrease as the project scale up and as more experience is, is made, the same way it has happened with uh, solar. But the current estimates uh, by people like uh, Bloomberg are that even in 2050, uh, there will be a need for um, a carbon tax uh, at a relatively high level, possibly 90 US dollar per, per ton to make it uh, more uh, economical to switch to uh, green hydrogen compared to um, natural gas. And of course, why we focus on those things is because um, in Singapore, the, the potential for renewables is relatively limited, but we also need to develop those. And there's a new uh, target, more ambitious target that was uh, set yesterday uh, of 1.5. Uh, gigawatt um, by, by 2025, and, and, and we can also uh, import uh, some renewables from neighboring countries, 
uh, but presumably there will also be some uh, limit uh, due to geopolitical reasons to how much we are ready to import from, from um, other countries. Thanks, Bernard. And it's, it's great to hear that, you know, there are a lot of uh, focus already on on research and development of other emerging low carbon alternatives, which is, you know, definitely one of the switches that Singapore has identified in their uh, low emissions development strategy. And I just want to hold on to the last point that you mentioned, uh, you know, yesterday during the opening keynote, we heard about the 100 megawatt trial to import energy from Malaysia. And, and you know, if this is the potential to tap on clean energy resources uh, in, in neighboring countries, uh, Nirupa, if I could just turn back to you. Uh, just like to hear more from you, is interconnected grid uh, a reality in in this region? And what are some of the challenges in development and deployment of such projects? Yeah, th thanks for that uh, question, Caroline. And uh, as Hitachi ABB Power Grids, I mean, we've been working in the area of high voltage DC for, and you know, we're one of the inventors of high voltage DC technology. Uh, and it was fantastic to hear yesterday uh, the, the plans from the minister to start with the 100 megawatt interconnector between Malaysia and Singapore, which has been around for a while, but we haven't been trading electricity uh, between the two countries. And, and this just highlights that the challenge is not really uh, technical. From a technology perspective, the technology is, is available, has been available for quite some time. Uh, the way we see it, there are three key challenges uh, in implementing regional power grids. Uh, the first is you know, financial and legal frameworks that would enable that. Uh, the second is uh, you know, regulatory policy uh, and market structures that would allow this trading uh, and pricing mechanisms across uh, borders. Uh, and finally, it's technical harmonization of grid codes across, across countries. So if you think a bit about these, these three challenges, none of them are real technical challenges as such. Uh, so with uh, countries coming together as part of the ASEAN Power Grid Initiative, uh, it's definitely possible to foresee a future of interconnected power grids in this, in this region, provided there's the political will behind it. Um, uh, I can give some examples. You know, recently we energized the interconnector that connects northern India to, to southern India, where there is southern India is blessed with good wind resources. And with this interconnector today at 800 kilovolts, uh, ultra high voltage DC, uh, you know, we're able to transmit uh, clean energy to the northern India when there is sufficient uh, generation and, and adequate demand. And at the same time, when there is no resource, we're able to take uh, the, the energy from the northern parts of India where a lot of the central base load generation exists. Uh, so these interconnectors would help basically uh, help manage the generation of renewable resources in one location to, to the demand centers, the consumption centers. Um, yeah, so the, that, that's our view of the regional power grids. Uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, Technology-wise, uh, it's been proven over the last uh, several decades. Uh, it just needs really political will uh, and regulatory bodies to come together. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, we're seeing increasing, or at least hearing of increasing ambitions in the Southeast Asian region, especially, you know, to really push for the ASEAN power grid. And hopefully, uh, with the increased ambition, we'll see more cooperations uh, and, and the governments coming together to make that a reality uh, uh, sometime soon. Uh, Chikang and Calvin, if I can turn back to you. Uh, you know, we have heard about the other different prongs uh, in Singapore's zero emission drive. How does EV achieve synergies uh, with these? Um, and, and earlier, it was also mentioned about, you know, the, the role of storage towards mass electrification. Uh, if we can get your opinion on the second life of battery speed. So, uh, thanks for the question, Caroline. Um, we, we think that battery storage systems will continue to play a critical role towards the success of mass electrification of vehicles. Um, the right battery technology can address the operational requirements of a mobility platform, but not just that. Um, it can also be integrated with the renewable energy infrastructure for storage, fix shaving, and other applications, as mentioned before. Um, we, we have supplied batteries. We have equipped more than thousands of electric, hybrid electric buses around the world. And we, we do see that batteries will be coming back at the end of their operational life on the vehicles. So um, at Dura Power, we believe that um, these batteries, that when they finish their end of life, 
um, on the electric vehicle operations, they can be repurposed um, into secondary, secondary life applications. We have already started um, uh, to do that. Uh, since a couple of years back, um, we have batteries that's operated in a few for about 10 years now and, and they come back to us and we repurpose them um, and they're reused into C and I applications, for instance, right? Uh, we have them um, built into containerized um, battery storage uh, solutions and they are put into as part of an industrial setup, a factory, for instance. They are also used as like a, a huge power bank that you put into um, standing between the grid and the fast chargers, so for peak shaving. So these are some of the applications that we've done using Second Life applications. Um, we have successfully rolled this out in uh, China and Europe. Um, we think ASEAN will become a very um, good um, platform for us to do more uh, of, of this, right? So um, we'll be looking to do more of that in this region. If I may add to uh, Kelvin, uh, the energy market authority, I see uh, Bernard Nee, uh, the deputy CE uh, there in the midst. Uh, so EMA just announced uh, the largest uh, grid scale uh, energy storage system uh, in Singapore uh, just a few days ago. And the implementing company is actually uh, Sunsip, right? Um, in the longer run, uh, we do anticipate that the Singapore grid, as well as uh, other premises, uh, you know, uh, commercial industrial buildings, for instance, will take on uh, battery systems, uh, as stationary power, as backup power, and for other multifunctional usages uh, over time, particularly as the cost of uh, energy storage uh, continues to fall uh, steadily every year. Right? I don't think this is going to be imminent, but certainly the trend lines are positive for uh, larger scale adoption of uh, stationary uh, energy storage system. And what does that mean uh, for electric uh, vehicle adoption? I had earlier mentioned about the lack of uh, localized uh, power supply. So it's very much envisaged that uh, in due course, as uh, the amount and the number of sites hosting uh, energy storage uh, systems uh, proliferate in places like Singapore, that very same uh, battery asset can be used to manage and to mitigate the lack of localized power supply in many premises across Singapore, right? Rather than investing in upgrading the grid entirely, which can be very expensive, just for spurts, right? And it could be a one hour spurt in a 24 hour cycle. You tap on the battery system, and the battery system can very well be multifunctional, serving three, four, or five other functionalities, right? Backup power and, and uh, supporting the, the uh, stability of uh, uh, solar power uh, throughout Singapore. Right, so the same battery asset then can be caught on to manage the electric vehicle charging uh, at very intensive periods during a single day. And we don't need that throughout the whole day, only in spurts, and, and that, that uh, you know, series of spurts may only be one hour. So tremendous synergies between energy storage as a technology enabler and the proliferation of uh, electric vehicles in due course. But of course, that will be in the longer run, but in the near term, really smart charging solution, as I've articulated earlier, will be crucial. Right, so it's a phased approach and we need multiple prongs to really address the lack of localized power supply in Singapore and the region. Thank you. And you know, there are a lot of uh, topics and ideas that were brought up during this session uh, that unfortunately we're not able to uh, deep dive into, uh, even though I would love to. Uh, but hopefully that will prompt uh, more offline discussions uh, for the rest of the conference. So we're just nearing the end of our time here, uh, maybe I'll just uh, ask each of you to give a closing remark. Uh, and just picking up from what Chi Kyung mentioned earlier, I'd like to ask each of you if you may um, ask the government and policymakers, one ask to help accelerate the energy transition, uh, what would it be? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Bernard. Um, but I think we were very heartened to hear uh, yesterday the announcement about um, a research uh, fund of $49 million to uh, test bed uh, new low CO2 technologies. I think this type of initiative is very important, particularly in Singapore, where clearly um, gas, uh, I mean, the, the potential for renewable uh, will always be limited, and so there's a need for those uh, new technologies. So, so we would like to see more of that. Thank you, Sid. Yeah, so I think um, uh, 
as with any new technology change, I think there is there's a phase of transition in which uh, a lot of experimentation has to done. So if I could put one ask, my, my ask would be that over the next couple of years, it's, it's really important that we, we are tackling a number of challenges in this adoption of EV. And therefore, for, for tackling some of the challenges, whether it's you know, an IC parked in an in a EV space, uh, and how do you tackle such challenges, or what do you do to a car which has reached 100% SOC, a lot of experimentation needs to be done. A lot of test beds needs to be established. And oftentimes, uh, I think uh, this is maybe, if I can say, an Asia thought that we will look for references outside and then bring it to Asia once something has been proven. So uh, I think if one ask would be to really um, see what is the localized challenges and then really try and find and experiment and do some test beds across Singapore so that we can really also see the behavioral side of this uh, transition and how then we can really, for mass deployment, have the best case coming out of those um, those test beds. Thank you. And Europa? Yeah, thanks, uh, Caroline. So building on, on what my fellow panelists just said, I, I think it's important that uh, the energy transition involves both industry players like us, uh, the policymakers, and, and finally academia to come together uh, and test bed solutions to a stage where they can become commercially viable on their own. Uh, that's the only way to get mass adoption is once these solutions become commercially viable. So my ask is to continue to drive towards that uh, target over the next uh, few years. Thank you. Uh, Chikyo? Um, I will leave uh, one key word uh, with uh, policymakers uh, you know, in Singapore and the region, and the word is uh, integration. Right? When we talk about electric mobility, you talk about sustainable development, you talk about mass electrification, very often it cannot be solved by a single ministry. Right? And, and in many of the subject matter that I just mentioned, it cuts across four to five uh, ministries uh, for virtually everything that we are talking about today. Right? Really, so the, the key success ingredient in my view is really the ability for us to integrate, to present a holistic view and to get the various ministries and agencies to collaborate in a very meaningful manner. I, I think that would be the key success ingredient for many things that we're talking about today. Thank you. And Kelvin. So as the last person, I, I, I just got to agree with everything that was said <laughs> for me. Um, but just, just, to, just, to, just to add a point, uh, we believe that establishing a, a strong and local ecosystem is, is essential. Um, and this is to support and accelerate the, the uh, energy transition. And as far as government policies are concerned, um, I, I would uh, like to say that there should be policies that would drive more test baiting without the fear of failing. I think that's key, right? And, and uh, perhaps at a later stage, um, procurement SOPs in Singapore, for instance, need to be tweaked as well to be, to be more aligned towards a, a local and greener um, supply chain. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that brings us uh, to the end of our panel discussion. Uh, thank you, our panelists, for your very insightful uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, 